Hello everyone, my name is Naren and in this session let's talk about system design for Netflix. Netflix with about more than 125 million subscribers and its presence in more than 200 plus countries is a company which handles large category of movies and television content. Users pay monthly rent to access this content and uh, what that means to Netflix is that the user experience should be very smooth and enjoyable. Netflix operates in two clouds, first one AWS and OpenConnect. Both clouds must work together seamlessly to deliver endless hours of video for you to please. Netflix has three main components. Let's discuss them right now. So the first one is Open Connect, the second one is Backend, and the third one is Client. Okay, let's first talk about some high-level working of Netflix and then jump right into all these three components in depth. Without the knowledge of high-level working, if I go and explain the components of system design in the, for the Netflix, it will be pretty hard for you to understand. So I'll, I'm going to explain a high-level overview of Netflix. Uh, first, let's understand what is a client. A client is any device from which you play the video on Netflix. It could be your desktop, it could be Android, or it could be iPhone, or it could be your Xbox, or anything like that. Okay, the second thing is um, anything that doesn't involve in video streaming is all handled in AWS Cloud that I already explained. Anything which involves streaming the video is completely handled by Open Connection. Now, the question is what is Open Connect? Open Connect is Netflix's own CDN. In simple words, CDN is Content Delivery Network, which is a network of distributed servers which are placed in different locations or different countries or different places to serve the content much faster. Say, for example, you are in India and you have a website which hosts video in it. What if the user is requesting for a video which is hosted in your website from United States. That means the packets or the video should be traveling from the server in India to US all the way through under uh, sea cables uh, which is used for serving the internet, right? So that way two problems are there is a latency. The packet should travel from India to US and also the bandwidth is consumed just for that video. Now, how do we solve this problem? To solve this problem, what we need to do is, let's have more servers placed in different countries. Say, for example, the main server, which is in India, is called as origin or original server, and will have different cache servers, which holds all the video copies in different countries. As shown in this image, so there are five different edge servers which are placed in North America, South America, and one in Russia, one in Europe, and one in somewhere in Indonesia, right? If a user is requesting for the video which is in your website from United States, the video will be served from the nearest server, that's the server, the edge server which is in the United States. That way, the content will be delivered much faster and less bandwidth consumed between the, uh, India and the United States. Now that you understand what CDN is, Open Connect is Netflix's own CDN. What Netflix has done is they have placed a lot of servers in every country, like thousands of servers in each and every country, so that uh, if the user is requesting a video, the video will be played from the very nearest server uh, which is placed to that particular user. Without wasting much of our time, it's the time to see the system design for Netflix. And here it is. As I've told you earlier, except the Open Connect, rest all of the components are situated in AWS Cloud. Just the Open Connect is the network of distributed servers that is uh, maintained by Netflix. Now, let's talk about individual components in the system design. The first one is client. Netflix supports a lot of different devices including smart TV, Android, iOS, a lot of gaming platforms, game, gaming consoles, and web app. 
all these apps are written using uh, platform specific code. Netflix um, web app is written using React JS, and React JS was influenced uh, by a number of factors. Like the first one is startup speed, the second one is runtime performance of React JS, and the third one is modularity. Let's talk about elastic load balancers. Netflix uses Amazon's elastic load balancing service to route the traffic to different uh, front-end services and these are instances uh, which is actual response. These are the instances or servers. Uh, elastic load balancers are set up such a way that the load is balanced across the zones first and then the load is balanced across the instances. And this scheme is called as two-tier balancing scheme. So the first tier, that is this part, consists of basic DNS-based round-robin load balancing. So the request, when it lands on this load balancing, will first balance across these zones using round-robin. Um, what are zones? Zones are kind of logical grouping of servers. There could be three different zones in United States itself and one zone in India. It's it's very logical way of grouping servers together. And um, the second uh, tier of elastic load balance service is an array of load balancers um, instances which does round robin load balancing on the instances to distribute the request uh, across these instances. Uh, say for example, when the request comes in the first tier, uh, distributes the load on different zones, say the request landed here, and next year will distribute to, between these two instances. Now, let's talk about how Netflix onboards a video. Before a video or movie is made available to the user, what Netflix does is it does do a lot of pre processing, and this pre processing involves finding errors, converting the video into different resolution, different format. Um, this process is called as transcoding or encoding. What is transcoding? Transcoding is a process that converts a video into different format uh, and, and this will be optimized for a particular kind of device. As you already know that Netflix supports many different kind of devices or platform so we have to convert the video into different resolution to make the viewing experience much better. So you might ask the question, why don't we just um, play the video as it is how we get from the production house? Um, the problem is the original movie which we get, say for example this is the movie, it will be of about many terabytes sometimes and sometimes it will be of about 50 GB and uh, say a video of about one and a half hour movie will be like 50 GB and this will be pretty hard for Netflix to stream such a big file to every customer. Um, it could be a space constraint, it could be bandwidth and everything, right? Uh, if you're using iPhone, the resolution should be a lot smaller. If you're using uh, a web app, the resolution should be much bigger, right? So for different devices, you need to convert uh, the video, source video into different resolutions. Netflix also creates file optimized for different network speed. Say for example, you are watching a movie on you know, a slow network, then you might see uh, a movie which is played in very less resolution. If you're watching the same movie on high speed network, uh, the movie might be in 4K resolution or 1080p resolution. Uh, or sometimes when the bandwidth is less, uh, the the movie suddenly changes uh, the resolution. You might have observed like grainy kind of uh, resolution to sometimes suddenly high definition resolution. And this kind of switching is called as adaptive bitrate uh, streaming. To do that, what Netflix has to do is it has to create uh, multiple copies of the same movie in different uh, resolutions. Uh, approximately, Netflix creates about 1,200 uh, different copies for a single movie just to do that. And uh, that's a lot of files to be processed. Then how Netflix does that? What Netflix does is it uses a lot of different parallel workers to do that. So when they want to onboard a particular movie, they get the movie as a single file 
which is about say 50 GB and then what they do is they break that movie into a lot of different pieces or chunks you can say and put it all into the queue and then these tasks, uh, these individual tasks which um, to be processed for each clip will be placed in the queue and then these tasks will be picked up by the different workers and they all process uh, different chunks um, together and then they merge all this video or they place the different clips, um, uh, uploads the clips into Amazon S3. Now that our Amazon EC2 workers have converted the source movie to different copies of the movie of different resolution and different format, we have about 1200 copies uh, of different files for the same movie. Now it's time to push all of these movies into open connected distributed servers which are placed in different locations across the world. That means all these different copies will be pushed to each and every servers in the open connect network. So what happens next? When user loads the next Netflix app on his mobile phone or smart TV or on web app, what happens is all the requests like login, recommendation, home page, search, billing, um, customer support, all these kind of different requests are handled by AWS, uh, the instances which are in AWS cloud. And the moment you found, find the video which you want to watch and hit the play button on the player, what happens is the application will figure out the best open connect server and the open connect server will start streaming the video to the client over here. And also um, the clients are so intelligent that even though when the open connect server is streaming the video, these applications will be constantly checking for the best uh, open connect server which is available near to that particular application and switches dynamically based on the quality uh, of the bandwidth to that server and load to the open connect server. And this is how the Netflix application gives the best viewing experience to the user without any obstruction or interruption while you, you are watching the video. And with the information like whatever you searched, uh, whatever you typed and your uh, video viewing pattern, all this information will be saved in data centers in AWS and uh, uh, Netflix does create machine learning models using that data to understand the user better and to build the recommendation engine. Now let's learn about the next component called Zulu. And Zulu is a gateway service that provides dynamic routing, monitoring, resiliency and security. And this of the whole service can also be used to do the connection management and proxying the requests. Okay, so the, the main component over here is the Netty uh, server based proxy and this is where the request will hit um, first and then this will be proxying the request to the inbound filters over here. The inbound filter run before proxying the request and can be used for authentication, uh, routing or decorating the requests and the uh, request goes next to the endpoint filter. The endpoint filters can be used um, to return the static response or to forward the uh, request to the backend services. Once the backend service response uh, sends the response back, the endpoint filter will transfer that uh, response to the outbound filters. And the outbound filters run uh, after the after receiving the response uh, can be used for gzipping the content or to calculate the metrics or to even add or remove the headers from the response and once the response is written back to the netty server and it will send back the response uh, to the client and now what are the advantages of having a gateway service like this See, the advantages are many more. First thing is you can share the traffic. Say, for example, you can have a rule somewhere here 
that send um, this much of traffic towards these servers and send some traffic to these kind of servers of say different versions for example you can share the traffic from uh, having the rules set in endpoint filter and also you can do some kind of load testing say you have a new kind of server which is deployed in certain set of, set of machine and you want to do a load testing on it in that case also you can redirect a part of traffic to that particular uh, set of services and then see that what is the load that particular service or server can take the third one is you can test new services as when you um, upgrade the services maybe you want to test how it behaves with the real-time API requests right uh, instead of replace it deploying it in it, it deploying the new service on all of the servers what you can do is you can deploy that particular new service or upgraded service onto one server and then you can redirect some part of the traffic some percentage of traffic to that new service and then test that service in real time and also you can filter the bad request you can have custom rules set in endpoint to filter uh, the responses based on certain conditions say a user agent of a specific kind filter all the requests you can either have it in endpoint filter or you can have it uh, in the firewall also now let's see what is hysterisk hysterisk is latency and fault tolerant library designed to isolate the points of access to the remote uh, systems services and third party uh, libraries what that means is say for example you have a endpoint a from which the request and response uh, is delivered so this endpoint so in microservice architecture this endpoint might be requesting a lot of different other microservices which are in different systems altogether say for example this is in a server one server and uh, this could be in totally different server or this could be a third another third party service call and this could be in another machine these two could be in different machine just because this much this particular call is slow your whole endpoint might suffer a lot of latency the the time to deliver the response might take more time or say for example this service is down and that's the reason why uh, the errors will cascade so this request success and when this endpoint makes a request to uh, serve microservice 2 and microservice 2 in turn is making request to microservice 3 this if this is causing some error this error will cascade back to the endpoint and this response could go error um, might response respond with error so these kind of uh, problems we can control using histories um, which helps in stop cascading failures um, and also to do real-time monitoring and what are the applications of histories so here I have listed out few applications or few advantages of using histories when you're configuring your Hysterix, Hysterix will be uh, taking care of each and every um, microservices. What that means is you're kind of decorating the each and every microservices. And how it helps is, say for example, you want to keep your quality of service to this endpoint to one second or two second at max. That means that you should also set timeouts for each and every microservices. That means the first advantage is you can either gracefully kill the call to that particular microservice if the time taken to respond is greater than the preset time. Say for example you have set to 0.1 millisecond at max. If this particular microservice is taking more than 0.1 millisecond, the call to that particular service will be cancelled uh, and maybe if you have configured to give the default response it, the default response will be given back and the second advantage is when the threat pool for a particular microservice is full it won't even try to accept the next request and keep waiting for that it will just straight away reject the call so that the other microservice handles the error and continue forward or do whatever whatever the mitigation it wants to do or it could fall back to the default response and the similar case the third point is it can do the same thing like providing the default response or totally uh, taking down the 
microservice if the error rate is greater than some percentage of uh, errors. And the fourth point is fall back to the default response. As I've already mentioned, this option you can opt. Say, for example, if this microservice is always causing error, you can configure it to give a default response so that still other microservice works gracefully. Um, just because of this microservices error, other services, or the, the total endpoint will not fail or will not send their error response back. And the fifth one is it will be much useful to collect the metrics uh, to understand how these microservices are performing. So history gathers the data about the latency, about the performance and everything and puts it in a dashboard so that you can understand what services is perform performing how better. Netflix uses microservice architecture to power all of its API needs to applications and web apps. The request calls uh, to any endpoint goes to another service and it keeps on happening. Say for example, the, this is endpoint as I've already explained, when the request lands in endpoint A, the endpoint A might be calling one more service, microservice, and after that it could be calling uh, microservice 2 and then this microservice might be calling to another microservice like this. So this strategy works very well for them as these microservices can be distributed across different instances and, um, and they are using some kind of uh, HTTP call sometimes and sometimes they are using RPC call between these microservices like RPC call here, RPC, RPC calls. So that way it is much easier to talk to these microservices from any different uh, endpoint service or any other microservices. So with so many services, microservices in place, how do you make this system much reliable? Because you have so many microservices, any microservice can throw error, or they might go down. How do you make it more reliable? So the key to that is a few things. As I have already explained, use histics like um, monitoring service or you separate out the critical API endpoints uh, from having less dependency. Say for example, you have two endpoints and this endpoint is having a lot of dependency to other microservices. But you, this, you know that this particular endpoint is a lot critical for your web app to load. So what you have to do is this particular endpoint, separate that as a critical uh, APIs or critical endpoints and have less dependency to do for, for that particular endpoint. Or you have the dependency to the endpoint which is also much reliable, say have less dependency. So you have a dependency only to the microservice 10 and this is also reliable. And if you see, uh, if you compare the endpoint A and B here, the dependency for the endpoint B is a lot lesser and since we know that this is kind of much reliable microservice, that way your endpoint B is always available, uh, highly available and always scalable. And uh, how do you choose like what are the APIs or endpoints, those are like critical endpoints. So critical endpoints are the endpoints, say on worst case on something has happened to your system and all the microservices are throwing error, irrespective of that your application, if you want to make your application, what are the APIs needed? Say in case of Netflix page, uh, user will visit to netflix.com, the basic functionality like at least search should work and um, they should navigate to their favorite video. Uh, favorite videos and then click it and play the video at least uh, rec forget about the recommendation forget about other things it means that the critical APIs are those which is like on the event of other APIs are not available at least users should be able to do the very basic things you have to identify those kind of APIs and separate them as critical uh, endpoints and then make sure those are highly available so the next key thing is having all the endpoints stateless. Say for example your API is talking to some server which is near to you. For some reason if that endpoint is throwing back the error, that means that you can always switch back to a different server automatically and then get the response. That means that the state shouldn't be preserved in a particular server's cache or a local memory or such that. 
So the key to that is always build your endpoints with stateless um, thing in your mind that always user should be able to get the response properly from any different server available at that given point of the time. In any application, there will be so many endpoints in which data can be cached or the response can be cached. These kind of APIs are the very good candidate to relieve the pressure on the actual servers. And there are some other endpoints which in which we always need to get the data, latest data from the DB. And these kind of APIs, we can't cache it because it could lead to other kind of problems. How Netflix solved this problem is they built their own custom caching uh, layer called as EVCache, which is based on Memcached. They have deployed a lot of clusters on number of EC2 instances in which there are so many nodes of Memcached and they even have their own cache client. How specifically this, this cache client works is whenever there is a write happens to the cache that is EV cache, it writes that particular response to every cluster available or every, every nodes available in that particular clusters. And when the read happens and the read will not happen from everywhere, it's obviously right, it's, it, the read will happen only from the cluster, the nearby cluster. And that way, the cache is distributed across the network of the servers, the network of the caching server, and also the read is happening from the very near server. And this helps them to reduce a lot of pressure on the actual endpoints. The advantages of having caching layer in your system is First one is throughput, okay? Your system's throughput will be a lot higher. The second one is latency. You can actually reduce uh, the response time compared to the data is being fetched from the source or the database. And the third one is you can save some money. That means that you can reduce the cost which is responsible to deploy more number of API or endpoint servers. Netflix heavily uses the caching layer for all of its API endpoints. That way they are already saving a lot of money on EC2 instances. And also one more optimization what Netflix has done is since the EV cache is their custom implementation on top of Memcached, um, they are starting to use the SSD uh, solid state disk uh, instead of RAM. As you know that Memcached works on in-memory or RAM, right? The, the cache particularly is faster just because all the data is saved in, in memory instead of saving it in hard disk. The time taken to read the data from RAM is a lot faster than the time taken to read the data from hard disk. But SSD sits in between RAM and hard disk. The, the time taken to read the data from SSD is a lot um, uh, faster when you compare to the spinning disk hard disk which we use conventional hard disk. And it is little higher, uh, the time taken to read the data on SSD is little higher than the RAM. But it is okay uh, when it compare the cost incurred to acquire a lot of RAM uh, to build this cache cluster. Let's talk about databases. Netflix, Netflix uses two different kind of databases, that is MySQL and Cassandra, that is RDBMS and NoSQL for different kind of purposes. Netflix saves the data like billing information, transaction information, and user information in the MySQL as it needs ACID compliance. All the other data like user viewing history and all the big data is saved into Cassandra. Netflix has a setup like master master setup for MySQL. Netflix has deployed MySQL on Amazon EC2 in large instances using InnoDB setup. Say for example, you're writing something to the master and immediately whatever you have written to the master is replicated to the another master node and then only the acknowledgement will be sent for the, um, the update or the right queries which you have made to the first master. And also um, Netflix has read replicas in each and every, for each and every nodes. That way um, it handles the scalability and higher availability of the RDBMS. Since these real replicas are available locally and cross data center, we can achieve always high availability as all of the read queries are redirected to the read replicas, only the right queries are redirected to the master. In case of master failure, what um, how Netflix handles is 
All it does is change the uh, configuration in route 53, that is the DNS configuration, to redirect all the write queries to the backup node or the second master node. As you know, Cassandra is open source, distributed, NoSQL, schema-less, um, which can handle large amount of data on any commodity servers, right? And Cassandra can also handle heavy write and heavy reads. As, uh, as Netflix started to acquire more and more users, it started to accumulate a lot of user history. User history in the sense like users' search history, users' viewing pattern, users' uh, interest and everything. There was tons of data that um, even the Cassandra uh, nodes started to completely fill up. So Netflix redesigned the Cassandra thinking, uh, keeping two important goals in their mind. First one is smaller storage footprint and the second one is consistent read and write performance. If you see the ratio of read versus write uh, in Netflix, it was almost like 9 is to 1. So there is, they are needed to make some kind of optimization to the Cassandra. Somehow they can store too much of data and also um, give the read and write performance also. And now I'm going to explain how they did it. To optimize the data storage on Cassandra, Netflix engineers did a clever thing. What they did is, whenever the data is accumulated too much, what they do is they run some scheduled job and it segregates the data into two different sections. Consider this is the data which is filled in the Cassandra. They segregate the data or they separate the data into live viewing history and compressed viewing history. What that means is live viewing history is the historical data of the user which is recent. Say for example this much of data is something very recent and this much of the data is a lot older. So keeping the data just like that on Cassandra will just consume the space. What they do is these scheduled jobs will compress this particular data, this much of old data and put it into the separate Cassandra nodes as compressed viewing data and all the recent data were retained as live viewing history as this much of data is frequently used for uh, any ETL jobs but these jobs, these, these data is important but it is kept as compressed history whenever they wanted that information to be processed they will uncompress it and then use it at that particular time now let's learn how Netflix is using Kafka and Apache Chikwe um, to ingest the data which is produced from different systems in the uh, Netflix. Netflix produces about 500 billion events or it is equivalent to 1.3 petabytes of data every day, which includes information like video viewing activity of a user or users UI activity or error logs, performance events or troubleshoot or debugging events or logs. Apache Shukwe is open source data collection system for collecting logs or events from distributed system. It is built on top of HDFS and MapReduce framework which also has Hadoop's scalability and robustness. It also comes with a um, lot of toolkits uh, powerful toolkits for displaying, monitoring purpose, which also comes with dashboard. And how the data flows through Chikwe. All the logs or the events from different parts of the distributed system will be sent to Chikwe. In from Chikwe, you can either do monitoring or analysis or you can use the dashboard to view the different events. Once Chikwe gets this data, it can also forward the same events to different sources like S3 and um, Kafka and, uh, and does the same thing. Chikwe forwards the data to S3 and also a copy of the data is sent to Kafka. And Kafka routing service is responsible for moving data from uh, fronting Kafka to various things like Amazon S3, Elasticsearch and uh, other secondary Kafka. Routing of these messages are done using Apache SAMSA framework. When Chikwe sends traffic to Kafka, it can deliver full or filtered streams, sometimes 
we need to apply further filtering on Kafka streams written from Checkway. That is why we have the router to consume from one Kafka topic and produce to different Kafka topic. And as you know, the events or the logs are flowing through Chikway, through Kafka, and then ending up in Elasticsearch, right? And let's learn how Netflix is using Elasticsearch and for what purpose Netflix is using Elasticsearch. And as I've already mentioned to you that Netflix has about 1.3 petabytes of data every day. And Netflix needs some place to save this data and do some kind of uh, visualization, right? And Elasticsearch comes handy uh, to do that task. They are running about 150 clusters of Elasticsearch and about 3,500 instances alone just to um, dedicate it for Elasticsearch to hold the data and uh, for the visualization using Grafana or Kibana. And let's see how exactly Netflix is using uh, Elasticsearch. Netflix is using for customer support to understand or debug or trace what's happening in the system. Uh, say for example, a customer tried to play a video and he couldn't stream the video. It is showing some error. Now he calls up the customer asking for the reason. Now customer support should understand what's happening or why the video is not able to play for that particular reason. All they do is go to Elasticsearch and search for the user um, some information and they get to know all the events happening for that particular user. They get to know why the video was not streamed, what error was thrown. Not just for this, admins at Netflix are using Elasticsearch to understand what's happening in the system. Um, other use cases are like uh, Netflix is also used to see errors in signups, errors in logins uh, and uh, to keep track of resource usage in the Netflix also. Let's learn how Netflix is using Spark and machine learning to do recommendation and all different sort of stuff. Spark is used for content recommendation and personalization. A majority of these machine learning models are ran on these large Spark clusters. And then these models are used to do sorting, row selection and recommendation. What that means is when the user loads the front page of the Netflix, Netflix should decide what to show to the con what content to be shown to the user. Say, for example, when you load the uh, front page, you get to see the rows of different kind of um, genres like comedy uh, movies or action movies and romantic movies, right? So Netflix personalizes what kind of rows selection to be shown to a particular user. All these decisions are happening based on the user's historical data and his preferences. And also inside that particular row, you need to sort the movies in an, in an order. And the sorting should be in a way that um, should entice the user to watch those kind of movies. Uh, and Netflix always tries to retain the user uh, in, in their application to uh, make users watch more video. To do that, uh, they need to come up with a proper sorting uh, logic. And also they need to do a recommendation um, of movies to the users, right? For that, they need to calculate relevance, ranking for different content available on their platform. Now I'm going to explain in a little bit brief on how Netflix does recommendation and personalization stuff. Two things, one is artwork personalization and also movie recommendations. Netflix personalizes artwork just for you. Say for example, when a user opens the Netflix homepage, you will see banner ads uh, for different web series, different movies, right? And also when you search for a particular movie, it will show a list of all the movies uh, for a genre or something like that. When, the, when, when Netflix shows different movie list, it also shows the header image. Header image is like thumbnail for a particular video, right? Netflix will not be knowing what thumbnail people will like or what for what thumbnail um, the click-through rate will be high. Netflix always wants you to stay in their platform, watch more videos. It, they want to intrigue you to watch videos, right? For that, they had to choose a proper or right thumbnail or header image for movie or any video. How do they choose those images? 
For any movie, Netflix creates about 9 to 10 different artworks for a particular movie. Now, Netflix doesn't know which one user likes more. What they do is randomly they will show different header images for different users. And then they analyze what for what thumbnail there were more click through rate or users watched more video and for what thumbnail user didn't watch. Based on these kind of analytics um, information, Netflix will decide what artwork will be shown in future. As you can see in this example, Stranger Things web series has about nine different thumbnails or header images. Initial, uh, initial days when Stranger Things was launched, Netflix would have shown all these different header images to all the different users. Based on the results from the users, uh, they selected one particular thumbnail that will be used later uh, as a permanent header image for the Stranger Things. Say for example, in this image which is shown now, the center image or a header image would have got about 1000 uh, watch uh, video watches and the other videos would have got about different numbers. Based on this, you can easily make out that people are more interested in that particular video if we show this particular header images. That means that in future also, if we keep showing this particular uh, header image, there are high, more chances or high likely that user will watch that particular video. Movie recommendation system is a very important service for Netflix because Netflix want to retain the user base. To retain the user base, Netflix should show relevant and amazing content which Netflix has. Users can't just discover any, any content like that. Only we can hear from our friends and peers and colleagues and then we can watch. But apart from that, if user wants to uh, discover content, it happens only through the recommendation engine. So user uh, does all sort of things like collecting the user interaction data, user's history, user's uh, what are the information available from the user and does employ machine learning models to figure out the uh, different um, recommended videos. So what are the different kind of data Netflix looks at to um, get this recommendation models? First one is the interaction with the service, how user is interacting with the Netflix service. And other members' taste also matters. It's not just a particular user's. It should be a collective, um, collective kind of information. And also, all the metadata which is available from the previously watched videos for a user. Like metadata information like title of the um, content or the video, actor or actress or directors, genre and everything. Based on these also we can build recommendation engine and also what device from which the user is mostly watching the content and also what time of the day a user is active. So taking all of this information one uh, can predict what a user might be interested or what kind of content user might be interested. So Netflix employs two different algorithms. One is collaborative filtering and the other one is content-based filtering. The idea of collaborative filtering is if two clients or two users have similar rating history, then they will behave similarly in future. Say for example, uh, there are two persons. One person has liked a movie and then he watched one more different movie. And if the other person also likes the movie, that means that most probably he might also watch the same movie which the other user has watched. And similarly, the idea of content-based filtering is that this algorithm aims to recommend the movies based on the similar movies which I have liked before. Say for example, if I keep watching a lot of comedy movies, that means that the system will understand that he is interested in comedy genre and then it will keep recommending the movies of comedy type. Let's talk about how Open Connect works or Open Connect Appliance works. Open Connect Appliance is just another server which only caches Netflix video content and serves only to the Netflix 
subscribers or customers. This Open Connect server is specifically designed for Netflix purpose only. And this is how the Netflix or OCA looks. Open Connect has these features. First one, that the Open Connect is provided free of charge to only the qualified uh, partners and the partners are ISPs. There are two benefits uh, by providing free of charge. First one is it helps Netflix, Netflix customer uh, to get better quality of video streaming and the second thing is ISPs um, bandwidth footprint will be lessened because uh, if you see here this consider this as the ISPs network since the OC Open Connect server is placed inside the uh, ISP all the video transaction or the packet flows only inside the ISP to the customers. That way the bandwidth will never cross uh, the ISP to the internet. That way this bandwidth will be saved, uh, a lot of bandwidth will be saved there. And the second thing is high availability. Open Connect is designed to be high availability and fault tolerance by having extra redundant components placed inside the server when uh, building the server itself. Say for example, it will have two power supplies. If one power supply goes down, it will just switch us to another redundant power supply. Similarly, all the other components are added uh, with extra components to make it high availability. If you see the amount of traffic which Open Connect is serving as of now is about 125 million hours of traffic uh, content every day that is almost equal to uh, the traffic equals to 10 terabytes of data per second there are different kind of open connect servers also the one is small connect small open connect server and there are big open connect servers also available small open connect servers are given to mostly small isps uh, which only caches very popular content um, whereas big open connect appliances caches every video which is uh, which netflix actually has in its catalog now let's see how netflix caches the content on to open connect servers how does netflix figure out what content to be cached on which server since there are different kind of servers where one server is of a big size some are small open connect and there could be open connect clusters also then how netflix figures out what content to be cached where there are two strategies to it the first strategy is figure out all the content which is very popular worldwide that means that there are user uh, users in every places uh, in the world that they are watching that particular series that means that that content should be cached in every server in the world but there are some content which is popularized only in some part of the country or some part of the uh, continent, right? How do they predict that? Based on the historical viewing pattern. Netflix checks all the historical viewing pattern of uh, different location and it is for sure that if uh, of some set of people are watching uh, a series one, episode one, that means that they will most likely watch the next episodes the next day or upcoming days that means that netflix uh, pre proactively caches those next episodes into the servers which is near to that location and also how netflix distributes the content or cache content on uh, open uh, connect clusters say we have open connect cluster with um, five different open connect servers inside the cluster now, how um, Netflix distributes the cache among these servers? So, Netflix uses consistent hashing here. So, if you see here, the server 1, server 2, server 3, everything is in the consistent hashing ring. And they specify that uh, the server 1 will be caching um, the file hash from 0 to 10,000, from the server 2 from 10,000 to 20,000, something like that. What they do is hash the file name of the cache or the clip which you are trying to cache and then on the hash value check uh, the range with which the content falls into which 
uh, server and the cache will be saved in that particular server. When the request for that particular video comes into the cluster, the same thing happens. Do the hash of the file name and then check in which server that range falls into and the cache will be present there. If the cache is not present, then the request will be forwarded to the Netflix main server um, that is in the AWS cloud and then it gets the content and then saves it here. We have reached to the last section of the system design uh, of Netflix. That is a few miscellaneous things. Netflix uses most of AWS cloud infrastructure like Route 53, SQS for queuing, SNS for a different notification purpose, or Route 53 for DNS resolution, and Amazon AWS auto scaling for scaling their uh, infrastructure also. Um, I will leave all the document links uh, in the description. Please go through them to understand the components in depth and also go through Netflix um, engineering blog in medium.com. Um, and that's it. Um, I'm open for the suggestion. Please suggest me if there are any modifications needed in my videos. And uh, thanks a lot. Please subscribe to the channel, like the video and share the video with your friends. Thanks a lot.